As winter looms, so does a humanitarian crisis, especially in countries vulnerable to climate change and armed conflict. With the International Committee of the Red Cross sounding this dire warning, will the world come together to hold off the threat? And we also look at how one man changed an impoverished region in South China with dedication and agricultural innovation. Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. Climate change fallouts are engulfing people who haven't received sufficient attention and assistance. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, says countries that contribute at least to climate crisis are getting hit the hardest. Many are suffering double damage with extreme weather disasters as well as armed conflict like Afghanistan. What strategies can the ICRC adopt to hold off this looming humanitarian crisis? Will the world come together to help? Earlier, I spoke with Pierre Créambule, personal envoy of the ICRC president to China and also head of the ICRC East Asia delegation. Let's hear what he said. Mr. Créambule, today's climate and environmental crisis threatens the survival of humanity. That's the first sentence written in the Climate and Environmental Charter for Humanitarian Organizations, which is released by the ICRC. And the charter had already been signed by 160 organizations before the start of COP26 to urge world leaders into action. What's the charter all about and why the urgency? Well, first of all, I think we have to realize that we are all, each and every one of us, at risk because of the effects of climate change. Now, what we have observed is, of course, that not everyone is at risk in the same way. Not everyone is equally at risk. And what the Charter highlights is that very often people who have the least contributed to climate change are the ones that are the hardest hit. And in ICRC terms, what we observe is that people who are already affected in situations of armed conflict are made doubly vulnerable by the effects of climate change. And I think this is a dimension that is often overlooked and underestimated and that needs a lot more attention. Some people are pointing out that we need to pivot from war aid to climate aid. According to an article published on the ICRC's supporting organization, Climate Center, only 6% out of a total of 30 billion U.S. dollars in humanitarian assistance was allocated to climate aid in 2020. Uh, do you agree that this was a fair amount to be devoted to climate aid? Look, again, I think what is very important to see is that many countries that are affected by armed conflict are also among those that are the hardest hit by the effects of climate change. So two things really need to happen. On the side of humanitarian organizations, we need to improve the way that we support populations to be able to cope with this double effect. So that's for humanitarian organizations such as ours to change the way in which we work and respond to protect communities, strengthen their resilience, help them to cope with the double dimension. But what we realize also is that there is a disparity in the way in which climate financing is distributed. Hmm. The majority, about 70% of all climate financing currently goes to middle income countries and not to least developed countries which are those that are often also the least well prepared to cope with the dual effects of climate change and conflict. And this despite commitments that were made in the context of the Paris Agreement. So here we need a change of mindset because if donors and institutions that are supposed to support climate financing hesitate to invest in countries that are conflict affected, then we are in a vicious circle uh, and especially very negative for the populations concerned. 
Most of the countries vulnerable to climate change are also affected by conflicts. That's uh, what you said, and also that's according to an ICRC report published last year. So how exactly are these two factors amplifying humanitarian crises? Are vulnerable populations getting the attention and the resources they deserve and need? Uh, just now you said a uh, greater amount of resources actually go to middle-income countries. Why? Well, first of all, you're, to answer your question very directly, do these populations get what they need? The answer is clearly no. And uh, think of the work that was prepared also in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow. It indicates among the 25 countries that are most uh, at risk and, and least prepared to cope with the effects of climate change, 14 of them are caught up, engulfed, and mired in armed conflicts. So it's very clear that the impact of climate change amplifies and exacerbates uh, the suffering of people in the south of Iraq, where water scarcity and conflict impact the choices that communities have to make to survive. And these interconnections, again, need to be better understood, and we need to highlight them more actively in the international setting. Afghanistan is a case in point. It's suffering from food shortages and displacement, exacerbated by the harsh winter, together with the constant threats of terrorism. What has the ICRC been able to do so far? How do you know it's reaching the people in need? So first of all, Afghanistan is a country where I have worked myself. I have visited numerous times. It's a country that is close to anyone's heart who has worked in the ICRC. It is a country and these are people who have suffered decades of, of war. In many ways, it's a country on its knees in terms of the ability to cope with more shocks. And indeed, at present, the, the data that is available is that about 47% of the Afghan population faces food insecurity in one form or another. Mm. Now, the winter is coming, but I think what has to be understood in particular is that the financial support, the aid, but also financial flows into Afghanistan have essentially currently dried up. And that therefore, institutions that crucially provide for the needs of uh, the people are currently facing incredibly dire circumstances. So what ICRC is doing, for example, in central and southern regions of Afghanistan, we are supporting farmers in their choices with cash so that they can uh, either direct that cash to uh, food needs, uh, education needs of their children, but also medical uh, supplies and needs that they uh, may require. These are adjustments that we make to our operating modalities in order to serve the people as best we can. What exactly is uh, standing in the way and how big is the funding gap for Afghanistan and how are countries reacting to the call for funding? So we have, and our colleagues in Afghanistan, have carried out uh, a range of assessments to see what are currently the most critical needs in this new phase and where can we as ICRC make the biggest difference, uh, cooperating with our colleagues in the Afghan Red Crescent Society and other actors in the country. And where we see some of the greatest needs is in the area of health. ICRC has historically uh, invested a great amount of energy and efforts in the sector of health, uh, supporting hospitals, clinics, and health centers. And exactly because of what I highlighted earlier, the interruption of financial flows into the country, this sector is very much at risk. So we are supporting and engaging there uh, very actively. And this is an area of priority that we will uh, certainly focus on greatly. We need about 150 million Swiss francs or 160 million US dollars until the end of 2022. We will mobilize support from states. And in that regard, uh, we are approaching uh, China and uh, this is a priority for us. We welcome the fact that uh, our partners in the Red Cross Society of China have come forward with the first financial support, which we are very grateful for. And we are now continuing the dialogue also with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We, we hope that there are avenues of cooperation that can open up. Exactly. Since you are, you are here in China, uh, what else can you tell us about what you have been able to do, what you have been able to achieve in collaboration with Chinese authorities in providing humanitarian assistance in general? 
So we have, first of all, learned a great deal from Chinese perspectives, and we think we have also brought the ICRC's experience to many of the conversations that we've had over recent years, but also in particular in recent months with the changes that have occurred in Afghanistan. I'm very grateful for the dialogue and the quality of that dialogue with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Red Cross Society of China. Mm. There is one area of focus that we have, which is, as I said, the health sector in Afghanistan. China built the Mirwais Hospital, which is in Kandahar and is still today known as the, the Chinese hospital. Uh, China has also built a hospital in Kabul, and there are among the efforts that the ICRC is investing now in supporting, strengthening the capacity of hospitals throughout the country, uh, a possibility for us to cooperate in that regard, and we would be very interested to build that cooperation and to seize the opportunity of responding to the needs of Afghan people together uh, with China in that regard. Good to hear that, and I do hope that these efforts will come to fruition as soon as possible. Finally, world leaders have convened many times during the second half of this year discussing climate change cooperation and solutions for regional turmoil. What do you assess? How do you assess the current atmosphere of international cooperation on these subjects? What's needed to turn momentum into a greater concrete action? You know, I think we can be honest about the fact that there is insufficient uh, cooperation at a multilateral level. Uh, I think when we look at issues like climate, when we look at issues such as the response to the COVID pandemic, but frankly speaking, also in the areas in which ICRC works uh, in relation to armed conflict, conflict resolution, we find that there is insufficient uh, collaboration at a global level. I would call it a, a deficit of collaboration, mm. probably still in many ways a deficit of trust and certainly also a deficit in the ability to bring peace to many regions of this planet. And I think it would need there a new mobilization and we would call uh, for that of building trustful relations among states because at the end of the day it is the fate of humanity that is at stake when you think of the combination of climate, of COVID, and of conflict. Really, when you look at all those issues together, there is no way to address and resolve these issues. We can have the same conversations in 10 or 20 years, and we will see the same needs. So also when you work in a humanitarian organization like the ICRC and you have people in front of you every single day, our colleagues around the world having to face the injustice, the suffering and the pain uh, that these communities go through, we really would call for an upsurge in cooperation and in trust building uh, to find the necessary answers to all these challenges.